of a conservative revival. You'd have to convince me that they're back in touch with reality. It's going to take an awful long time for the Tories to come back. My parents voted Tory. I used to vote Tory, but uh, I felt they made such a... not a very good job. I think they need to raise their profile a bit and and uh, show people what action, if any, they're taking or, or what advances they're trying to make. I don't think it's still a safe Conservative seat. I think it's changed probably forever now. I think they should have a much stronger foothold in Eastwood than they have at the present time. But I hope by the next election, the people who change their vote will go back to where it was before. Voters there in Eastwood. Well, earlier today at his home near Edinburgh, I spoke to Sir Malcolm Rifkind about his report. I began by suggesting that Westminster is always sovereign and cannot be dictated to by a devolved Scottish Parliament. You can't technically, but you need an unambiguous political commitment. See, we think the government's being rather timid. Uh, devolution is going to happen. There's going to be a Scottish Parliament. We all want it to be a very successful one so that it strengthens Scotland it helps uh, create a modern United Kingdom, a partnership of equals is the phrase that we've used in this document. And that means actually addressing this in an imaginative way, an original way, not just a rather tired way as the government sometimes gives the impression. It's a cardinal rule of the British Constitution that you cannot bind a successor Westminster Parliament. So how in practical terms do you actually entrench constitutionally the Scottish Parliament? Well, you can make clear the political reality. This is a new United Kingdom coming into existence. You're quite right to refer to some of the old concepts, and some of them will have a, still a formal existence. But the political reality uh, is that we're getting a new kind of United Kingdom. It needs a new language for the Union, a partnership of equals. And if it's a partnership of equals, that means there has to be that binding commitment uh, for the Scottish Parliament, as indeed for other parts of the Kingdom. But if you look at this idea and indeed some of the language in this document, it is so constitutionally robust, it's hardly devolution at all. Well, it's very sensible when you think about it. I mean, I think the government have been appallingly silly in inventing this term first ministers. I mean, it sounds like something out of the Politburo of the old Soviet Union. Uh, the reality is, if you look at Canada or Australia, they have one prime minister for Canada, but they have a premier for each of the states, and likewise in Australia. And I think for Scotland, I suspect for Wales or Northern Ireland, it makes much more sense. You see, the more you talk this up, uh, you continue to talk it up, you're talking it up on nationalist terms. The perception will be that you're talking a nationalist game. On the contrary, nationalism wants separatism. It wants to break up the United Kingdom. We're saying we acknowledge the will of the people of Scotland that there is now to be a new kind of United Kingdom. But we, therefore, as unionists, uh, have a tremendous interest in it working. And it's only going to work if it's set up on clear, unambiguous, straightforward principles. Now, a lot of what is being proposed by the government may make sense. Uh, a lot of it, however, is unimaginative and poorly thought out. And we believe that devolution is inevitably a dynamic process. It has implications for the whole of the United Kingdom. We have concentrated on those elements, particularly relevant to Scotland's interests, that ne need to be strengthened. Moving on to another issue now, to tax. The document states that the Conservatives are not in favour of increasing the overall tax burden. But where does that leave the traditional stance, which is that the Conservatives are a party of low tax? First of all, we're not just a Me Too party. There is a fundamental difference between the Scots Tories and all the other three Scottish uh, parties, Labour, Liberal and Nationalist. They all are essentially attracted to putting heavier tax burdens in one form or another. We start from the opposite premise. But we cannot ignore the fact that the starting point is Scotland with a much higher degree of public expenditure than is actually raised in Scotland through taxation. I mean, that is a factual reality. And until we get sufficient economic growth in Scotland so that Scotland actually does not need that kind of financial help from other parts of the United Kingdom, then one has to be realistic. So we're saying you don't increase the tax burden. Could the Conservatives go into those elections next May pledge to cutting tax? Is it possible? Well, that's for the party to decide. I, it's we're possible. I'm, our policy commission is making recommendations to the party. That'll be for David McCletchy and his colleagues when the manifesto is drawn up uh, to come to their view. I don't want to preempt that. Oh, obviously, that must be a possibility. What's your personal uh, but It's got to be a realistic one. What's your personal view? I think any policy has to be realistic. It mustn't just be populist. Is it realistic to cut taxes? I think it's going to be very difficult as long as Scotland retains uh, a position where it gets higher public expenditure. 
than does the rest of the United Kingdom. It'll be difficult. Whether it's impossible or not, time will tell. In terms of the section on local government, it talks in terms of elected provosts. What's the Conservative model in terms of how local government should operate? I think all governments, Labour and Tory, uh, have been responsible or presided over periods when local governments got weaker and weaker. And the reality is that the public haven't got very much interest in local government, as you see by the turnout of local elections. I think we have to reverse that. And I think the best way of reversing it is directly elected Lord Provost and Provost. And the reason for that is that that way you can attract people of real stature in the community, uh, whether they be from a business background or a professional background or a trade union background, doesn't matter. People of real stature give them a real job responsibility and authority and the authority and legitimacy that goes with popular election. That way we could hope to get back to a time when local government was something that attracted the best people and when you do that, then you get high turnouts and high public involvement. This document contains a lot of radical ideas, uh, your radical ideas. Why are you not standing for the Parliament? Well, I will be standing as a Scottish elected politician. This document, Scotland's future, it's about the Scottish Parliament. It's also about Scotland's continuing role in the House of Commons. Why are you not standing for it? Well, I will be an elected parliamentarian, I hope, and it'll be for the electorate to decide whether I'm elected or not. But going into those elections, there's no Malcolm Rifkin, no Michael Forsyth, no Ian Lang. Wouldn't the ideas in this document be far better prosecuted by individuals that at least the public know? Well, we are part of a team, and there are excellent people, including former mem members of Parliament, uh, who will be standing for the Scottish Parliament, Others will wish to represent Scotland in the House of Commons. With respect, uh, none of them that are standing are household names. Well, you say that, but there are... Well, no, come on. Every politician from Tony Blair down a while ago was not a household name. You become a household name, first of all, by being elected. That's something which uh, one always used to bear in mind. So, Malcolm Rifkin, when the Labour MP for Falkirk West, Dennis Canavan, announced last week that he would stand against his own party in the elections to the Scottish Parliament, he joined a small but notable list of MPs who have made such a fundamental political decision. In a moment, I'll be talking to Mr. Canavan, but first, Raman Bardwaj reports on the price of independence. No, rien de rien. No, je ne regrette rien. Ni le bien. I've been asked in this election by journalist after journalist coming in... When Jim Sillers was elected the Labour MP for South Ayrshire in a 1970 by-election, one of the most remarkable post-war careers got underway. Then the 32-year-old socialist firebrand was tipped as a future Scottish secretary. But he quit Labour five years later in protest at the minimalist devolution offered by the party after it returned to power in 1974. It's always an argument as to whether you're better staying in to try and change things or better going out because you can't stand being in any longer. I got to the point where I couldn't stand being in any longer. I thought the Labour Party had um, fallen into the hands of opportunists and that it had basically deserted the fundamental principles upon which the Labour Party had been founded. Sillers, like Dennis Canavan, enjoyed a high public profile. He formed the Scottish Labour Party in 1975. But he lost South Ayrshire in 1979 to the official Labour candidate, George Fawkes. The contest was bitter and left Sillers disillusioned. It's almost indescribable because I felt very, very low about leaving the Labour Party. Um, it was a terrible, terrible emotional time. And you were also, of course, leaving people whom you're very close to. I mean, I didn't have any enemies in the Labour Party in South Ayrshire or Ayrshire as a whole. And, you know, one day we were all friends, the next day they were my enemies. The South Ayrshire experience does not bode well for Dennis Canavan, neither do other high-profile defectors who took on the Labour machine. Paisley MP John Robertson, who formed the Scottish Labour Party with Sillers, decided not to fight an official candidate in 1979, despite representing the town for 18 years. In 1981, two Labour MPs joined the SDP. Dixon Mabin on the left was subsequently defeated, but Bob McClellan won, and is Dennis Canavan's only crumb of comfort. You're isolated, particularly if you're in the House of Commons. You become uh, uh, an on person, so as the part that party is concerned, and people with whom you've been friendly with for years and years suddenly uh, are distanced from you. So it's isolation. 
Dick Douglas has lived in the sleepy Fife village of Uktamukti for the last 26 years. His career, though, has been far from sleepy. He quit as Labour MP for Dunfermline West over what he saw as a lack of fight on the poll tax. Like Dennis Canavan, he played the candidate of principal card. It didn't work in either local elections in 1990 or at the 1992 general election when he left Dunfermline and was roundly beaten by Donald during Durskadden. I had no difficulty with the voters. I mean, I think left of the, the voters themselves that would have been a, a fairly friendly, um, but the battle of the Labour Party was intense, and they, their behaviour and personal, not just to me, but to anybody that uh, thought of supporting me, was, in my view, abysmal. No. Ron Brown's controversial tenure as a Labour MP for Leith ended when he was eventually deselected after lurid tabloid claims about his private life. One of his central complaints, like Dennis Canavan's, was that the party hierarchy was Stalinist in its treatment of him. They'll do everything, I'm judging it on my experience, they'll do everything to discourage you. And it, it might just be a tap on the door saying, Dennis Canavan is not standing. Or if it does stand, is, you know, he is not a valid candidate. Your vote is invalid. And they'll give them that individual another poster saying, you know, this is the official candidate. Like Jim Sillers, Dixon Mabin and Dick Douglas before him, Brown found that taking on the full weight of the Scottish Labour establishment was too much. He was defeated by Malcolm Chisholm in 1992. In Falkirk West next May, Dennis Canavan will await the judgment of the voters in his stand against what he sees as centralism in the Labour Party. He's held the seat for 24 years. You need uh, funding, you need uh, popular backing, you need an organisation. And obviously, if a um, person like Dennis Canavan is going to take on the bureaucrats in London, they'll be very nasty to say the least. I think it might be easier for Dennis to leave this Labour Party than it was for me to leave the Labour Party in 1975 because there was still a strong element of socialism in the Labour Party of 1975. I don't think, you know, stretching language uh, to its most credible could you say that Blair's Labour Party resembles a socialist party. The one consequence of Dennis Canavan's candidacy next May will be to throw the result in Falkirk West into doubt. The key question will be whether, like Sillers, Mabin, Douglas and Brown, Canavan will pay the ultimate price for his independence. And I'm joined now by Dennis Canavan. Dennis Canavan, we've heard there from three former Labour MPs who, in a sense, have paid the price of political independence. Uh, they found it difficult to take on the Labour machine. Do, do you expect a, a dirty campaign over the course of the next six or seven months? Well, can I make it clear at the outset, Bernard, that I am still a member of the Labour Party and I would still like Falkirk West Constituency Labour Party to be given the opportunity of deciding on a one-member, one-vote basis whether or not I am simply good enough to represent them in the Scottish Parliament. Now, you've dug up a handful of cases there, but these are not exact precedents uh, as far as my case is concerned. There is a certain uniqueness about my case, and it is this. I cannot think of a precedent whereby Labour Party headquarters have sought to undermine a sitting Labour MP against the wishes of 95% of the members of his constituency, the Labour Party, and against the overwhelming wishes of the electorate, because the, the Falkirk Herald has a poll in the edition tonight indicating that 89% <coughs> of the voters of Falkirk West constituency but would support me. We know that the real politique is that uh, you're not going to be allowed to stand, so you're going to have to make the stand yourself. Um, what about the point that was made by the Prime Minister on this very programme last week, namely uh, that since New Labour got elected, you have been out of touch in just about every major policy strand. Why would you want to stand for New Labour anyway? 
I think that uh, Tony Blair is guilty of exaggeration, to say the least, and I think that even Tony Blair looked at my voting record in the House of Commons, he would see that in the vast majority of cases, I have supported his government. On a minority of occasions, I have spoken out and voted against the government or abstained on principle on matters where I think that he has been acting against the interests of the people that I represent. For example, on student tuition fees, on the, on, on the, on the abolition of student grants, and on the, uh, on the taking away of the rights of the children uh, of uh, uh, single parents to, to benefits. These are all issues in which I have strong feelings. I explained to the whips I could not support the government. On some of these occasions, I voted against the government. On other occasions, I abstained in principle. Well, what, what do people want? Do they want a representative? Do they want a thinking person to represent them? Or do they want a puppet to go to Westminster or to go to the Scottish Parliament and just do what they want to tell them all the time? That's fair enough. But let me look at one of your central allegations against the Labour Party, namely that it is centralist um, and it is Stalinist. I mean, the reality is that the list of potential candidates for the Scottish Parliament is not full of Blairite clones. And if you actually look at a lot of the people, perhaps a majority of people who have been selected, they come historically from the left of the Labour Party. I mean, the point that the Prime Minister is making in your particular case is that you don't like the result of the democratic process, so you go in the half. There are some excellent people on that list, uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, but that list it's is not that sentence. list is it's not representative it's of, not the a part, of the spectrum it? of opinion within the Scottish Labour it's Party. It's not a Stalinist the late, the, all, late, the late John Smith believed in the Labour Party as a broad church, people of different traditions coming in, they're all debating there. together. The, 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 they're, they're, not, they're not all there on that list. They're not. Frank McAvity, Margaret Carran, Joanne that, Lamont, John McCallion, that, Mike that Watson, list Karen used, Turnbull, Andy Kerr, Paul McNeil. That list was used to exclude a lot of people, quite quite apart from me. Nobody from Falkirk West constituency was deemed to be worthy to represent the constituency in the Scottish Parliament. What kind of a message is that that the Labour Party is sending to Falkirk West? That there's not a single person in Falkirk West that is capable of representing them in the Scottish Parliament. That is centralism gone daft and it's really local democracy or central dictatorship. What do we believe in? I think the people of Falkirk West believe in local democracy. They're going to get the opportunity perhaps to vote for you in Falkirk West, but of course under the proportional electoral system you could actually stand twice in this election. Let me ask you, will you stand twice in this election and what will your policy prospectus be? Will it be more than just vote for Dennis Canavan because Dennis Canavan happens to be a good guy? I haven't uh, decided yet whether I will stand under the regional list system. My first commitment is to the electorate uh, of Falkirk West. Uh, and I am going to stand in Falkirk West on the first-past-the-post system. But an attractive additional option might be to stand also in the regional list uh, under the PR system, because the region takes in uh, parts uh, of the country which I used to represent before they changed the boundaries, places like uh, Kilsyth, uh, Banton, Queenieburn and so on, and I've already had a lot of messages of support. And I'll tell you, I'll not just be fighting this campaign uh, on local democracy versus central dictatorship. I'll be fighting on the issues such as student grants, student tuition fees, a decent life uh, for, for children of single parents mm -hmm. and, and more radical measures very, to get rid very, of unemployment very, very, and so very, on. Very briefly, is this a real emotional wrench for you to, to quit with Labour effectively? It is an emotional wrench, uh, but uh, I am thinking the thing through rationally. And I really do think that somebody has got to take them on. We cannot have this central dictatorship yes. going on continually. Dennis Canavan, thank you very much. That's it for this week. We are back next Thursday at 10.30 here in Scottish. Good night. with it you may know them and you may have seen them together we will catch them britain's most wanted friday at nine on scottish at glens hutchison robertson's and stepek you can now save up to 290 pounds on a short break to disneyland paris when you rent from the latest range of philips widescreen tvs rentals start from as little as four pounds 99 a week yes all the magic of the cinema from four pounds 99 a week 
Rent a Philips widescreen TV now with free delivery and free installation and claim your Disneyland Paris vouchers from Glenn's Hutchison, Robertson's and Stepek. You can't rent better, guaranteed. <laughs> If you're looking for the biggest selection of career opportunities in a Scottish newspaper, Scotland's appointments in the Herald on Friday is just the job. Don't miss it. Your future. Scotland's future. For the new era. Only in the Herald, every Friday. An agonising case in this week's episode of The Dog Squad. More than a hundred of them across the road. Stay with me. We'll release the house to you as soon as we can, but it'll be some time yet. <laughs>